We love to show you the sights and sounds of Asia. Look at look at this gentleman. Oh my God, that is beautiful. The majestic snow-capped peaks of the Himalayas or Himalayas, depending on your uh, the way you like to pronounce it. Remote, and you would think far away from the concerns about uh, what Tim Geithner is worried about. Do you think Tim Geithner imagines this when he's trying to chill from the daily grind of Washington D.C.? Maybe not. This is actually the birthplace of a school of thought which projects itself as an alternative to other ideas about how to fix the problems in the world. Don't you just want to put up a tent there and live there forever? Where is the solution to the crisis? Does it lie in Washington, D.C.? No, we know that. Does it lie in London? No, they got lots of problems there. Or does it lie in the hands of the talk shop known as the United Nations? A new thought process is evolving and becoming known as the Himalaya Consensus, or Himalaya Consensus, which rejects the Adam Smith and, dare I say, Gordon Gecko philosophy that greed in all its forms is good, that motivates, and if left unfettered, charges the world toward a blissful state of utopian equilibrium. Does it sound, sound a little bit up there in the uh, clouds or ivory tower? Join us today is Lawrence Brom, a global activist and author of lots and lots of books on the region, including his latest, The Anti-Globalization Breakfast Club, starring Molly Ringwald. No, I'm just kidding. Brom also served as advisor to the central banks of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, as well as the governments of Mongolia and China. And of course, Robert Kessler uh, joins us for this chat. Lawrence, fine, nice to finally meet you. Good to meet you. The Himalayan consensus. So everybody has to get to the top of the Himalayas and sit around and uh, uh, dance a trance or something like that. And uh, all the heavens will hand down the judgment and the real solution to our world problems. Actually, it's more grassroots than that. You know, we have to look at things from the top, <laughs> but we have to come up with solid grassroots solutions. And that's what the Himalayan consensus is all about. Mm -hmm. It really consists of three approaches. First of all, throw out the theory. We were too fundamentalist about theory. Mm -hmm. The Washington consensus has adhered to a series of policies that are based on shock therapy, on rapid uh, conversion of currency, privatization. And actually, there's a lot of things that can be done at the grassroots. If theory doesn't work, mm -hmm. kick it out. Go for solid solutions, solutions that change people's lives. Uh -huh. Second of all, mm -hmm. look at the values of the region. We have driven mm -hmm. many of our presumptions about economics based on what you just said, greed. And of course, many of the WTO uh, anti-globalization activists have been calling against this. Now after September mm -hmm. 2008, many people in America are saying the same thing. We need a more compassionate capitalism. Through globalization, our planet has become a village. And in turn, we need to think about how to handle the limiting resources. And then last of all, governance. Mm -hmm. Governance has to be responsible. It has to be able to address needs. What form government takes is less important than what that government can achieve. OK, now what I hear you say, this almost, get, bear with me for a second, but this almost sounds like a, let's go back to the Walden Commune. Let's, go, uh, let, let's reinvigorate the barter system. Uh, let's uh, elevate uh, Muhammad Yunus, the father of microfinance, to the guru of the world or something, and all the problems around us will fix ourselves. Stop fixing banks. Stop fixing banks. Bankers, fix little people, fix the bottom rung of the hierarchy, and bliss will ensue. I think you're mixing it up. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm a major supporter <laughs> of Mohammed Yunus. Uh -huh. Microcredit has been a tremendous success in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. It's also now being applied in New York City. Even in ghettos of New York, people are starting to adopt microcredit. Mm -hmm. So he's pioneered an approach. He's pioneered a very realistic solution to help people solve their problems, mm -hmm. to help people get out of poverty. It's not aid. It's empowerment, mm -hmm. and it's real, and it works. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's going to solve all the problems. And part of what we're talking about with the Himalayan consensus is there is no one model. There is one, no one solution. We mm -hmm. have to be pragmatic. Mm -hmm. We're not, this is not a, a philosophy that's based on uh, you know, theology. Mm -hmm. It's basically based on pragmatics. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of work with the Chinese government throughout the 1990s. A lot of the model of reform in China was top-down infrastructure spending, and it worked. And I was a major advocate of that model. But that model, or that experience, doesn't necessarily transcend to certain poorer countries. And the whole size of China is in itself a continent in terms mm -hmm. of its diversity and geography mm -hmm. and its, its, its different problems. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at in the Himalayas is many of the grassroots or localized solutions or experiences. And we're not even calling them solutions. We're saying these are experiences that can be exchanged. Mm -hmm. We have to look at how we can address issues, mm -hmm. not simply come in with high-level theories. Because mm -hmm. often, it's the advisors from the IMF and World Bank who are mm -hmm. going advising on village economics, but mm -hmm. they've never lived in a village. Mm -hmm. OK. Robert, Robert Kessler, you've been listening intently to uh, what Lawrence has been saying. 
you're from the other fold. You're from the other, completely other side. You're a man of economic science who does crunches the number, uh, quantum mathematics, is they up, and you've been show, already, already showing us a lot of the kind of charts that you think are going to define where the world is going. What's, what, do you, what, do you, what are you thinking? I, I mean, I like the concept. I mean, I really do. I, but I don't know quite how one implements that okay. in, in a size of, for instance, the Treasury in the United States. The Treasury faces problems that are so monumental uh, that from a grassroots viewpoint, I agree, that's probably what we should be looking at. That would be the consumer. Mm -hmm. That would be the small towns. Mm -hmm. But we're not. And how, how would you go about so looking e execution. at it? Execution. I think it's very important. Yes. In, in my new book, mm -hmm. we propose something that I call Manifesto. Can I have that? For a peaceful revolution. And it's okay. got basically 10 points. Pay for that. Mm -hmm. And the first, you have to pay for that, that's right. Okay. The first point is that um, the Washington Consensus has not necessarily worked. Mm -hmm. So we need alternatives. We have to recognize alternatives are out there. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have to try and find ways of having globalization that are balanced, that we can preserve ethnicity, preserve identity, but it has to be founded in solid economics. I'm not one of these people who's saying, oh, preserve this, but you have to have an economic foundation. If you don't have an economic foundation, all cultures will go into museums in the end. We are always evolving. I'm not against institutions like the IMF and World Bank, mm. uh, WTO. These institutions are important and key, but we need to start to bring them back to basics. They have become engrossed in their own bureaucracies. To a great extent, this is part of the problem. Mm. We need to look at corporate value. You know, you're in, you're in this business. In the 80s, we were talking about P&L. In the 90s, we were talking about you know, uh, shareholders' value, which was actually how much the CEO and management could spend in order to say they have market share. We need to talk about stakeholder value. We need and, to start. And, and the essence to that problem is consumption, then. Correct. And, and that is, that's where you run into a technical problem. Because in the United States, you want to save. and other countries, you want to spend. Mm. So how do, you, how do you reconcile that? I think if we look at the problem facing Tim Geithner today, stimulus package. Politically, it's the correct move. Mm -hmm. A stimulus package will probably turn the L dive into a U by year three and get the Democrats reelected. However, mm -hmm. a stimulus package that's intended to drive more consumption is not solving the ultimate problem. It's pushing it back to another generation yeah. and another president. Okay. Consumption, mm -hmm. an overconsumption is mm -hmm. our problem. Okay, we're gonna talk this through. Uh, lots of stuff that's come to pass is vindicating what Lawrence is saying. Lawrence and Robert uh, for another round of this right after the break. Here's a question for Lawrence Brom and, of course, Robert from Michael. Ready? Here we yes. go, folks. Sustainable economics with much less reliance on debt. When I say let's go, I'm trying to pull up the thing here. Uh, much less reliance on debt may be a great way forward. How do we implement this when bankers are so powerful and are bound to fight anything to put them out of business? It's a very good question. It kind of dovetails with uh, what you were talking about a bit earlier, Robert. Lawrence, Robert, both, take, take this up. Again, you know, one of the pioneering efforts of Mohammed Yunus was to say that credit is a universal human right. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is banks are not in tune with people. Mm -hmm. Banks have their own standards, they have their own way of going forward, but they're not necessarily in tune with the needs of people. Mm -hmm. Consequently, a lot of the people who, a lot of the companies that are getting credit from banks are not the ones who necessarily know how to use it or necessarily can turn around a profit and mm -hmm. return that money to the bank. A lot of the people in the street, a lot of the people who need money, who need credit, are not able to access it because the system doesn't address their needs. Mm -hmm. And that's why microcredit came about. Microcredit is actually a way of addressing people's needs. I think large banks like Citibank, Chase, all these very, very large banks mm -hmm. should start to adopt microcredit programs in urban areas. This is not only for the rural poor, mm -hmm. it can also help get a lot of people who are poor in America out of their situation. Ro Robert, you remember that M2 chart we were talking yes. about? I mean, yes. what, he, what, what Lawrence is saying, uh, see, it, it seems to echo exactly what you're saying. I mean, you were saying it differently, but you were, you were saying it nonetheless. We'll, 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 we'll yank that up for the benefit of those who might not have caught it in the uh, previous iteration, but uh, 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 address this. Let me, let, me, uh, let me look at it from the consumer's viewpoint, because that's right. really how we are looking at it. In the United States, the consumer always mm -hmm. uh, paid for its own problems. Yes. Actually, uh, in the First World War, the Second World War, the Reagan Cold War, yes. we had huge deficits completely covered by the United States consumer. Yeah. So the consumer was in charge and more or less got what it wanted. Uh, right now, over the last 10 years or so, the banks uh, and whatever other groups have been involved have really moved all the equity, mm -hmm. everything that the consumer had, into other hands. Mm -hmm. 
It's being taken back. Uh, people always underestimate the consumer and underestimate Main Street. First thing everyone says is the consumer will spend forever. Mm -hmm. Not true. We, we have no history of that in the United States, so I, I suspect we will see a change, and that change will be very positive, a little bit difficult, mm -hmm. generally from a GDP viewpoint, but that will be the change, and the consumer will do it and begin to elect representatives that reflect more of what they want. Mm -hmm. And right now, we don't have that. So uh, in, in a sense, we're in agreement. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of how do you enact the policy mm -hmm. that makes it work. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's really what we're talking any, about. Any counterpoint there, Lawrence? I agree. I, I don't have a counterpoint on this. Actually, I think we need to re-engineer our financial system. That mm -hmm. doesn't just mean big talk. It doesn't just mean a lot of countries have a meeting and say, yeah. this is the new Bretton Woods. Uh -huh. It has to deal with consumer needs. It has to be able to give people credit who deserve it. Mm -hmm. There has to be a situation that allows people to have small businesses. You know, we were very focused on, we create our products. We created the dot-com boom. All of this was about excess capital. It was not about new economics. Economics is the same, supply and demand that doesn't change. But we can't be fundamentalist about it, we can't go over the top. And just because you can spend more doesn't mean that you necessarily have the power. Mm -hmm. We uh, need a little bit more quality mm -hmm. in Look, our the products, the, not quantity. The only thing that makes bubbles is excess credit. There's nothing else that really makes a bubble. It's, it's not people? It, it's, it's not people as much as you have to have cheap credit, not low interest rates. Uh -huh easy credit, mm -hmm. and then you can leverage and leverage and leverage and leverage. Mm -hmm. um, there's an interesting statistic that it used to be 8% of household assets was in treasuries from the consumer. That would mean 8% of $40 trillion right. is $3.2 trillion. There'd be no deficit in the United States. Me, yes. that, so basically the, taking ownership in your country. Let me, let me show them that one here because we got this. Right. Right. So, interesting chart. Yeah, let me show this one and okay. I'll come right to you, Lawrence. Uh, U.S. Treasury ownership is a percent of household financial assets. I mean, it has been sliding. It's been slipping and sliding for the longest time. As I said, it's been slipping and sliding and sli for the longest time. <laughs> Don't okay, have. apparently we don't have that, so but I'm just going to hold it up for you, but that's, kind of, that's more or less what it looks like. So take a close-up, if you could. <laughs> yeah, take a close-up. Anyway. Uh, had, we got, had we got back to normal, just normal, 3%. Is that normal? No, that, zero that's percent? not. Zero percent? Zero percent is absolutely not normal. There we go. But, okay. But 3%, 3%, just moving it up a little bit, <laughs> would cover the whole American deficit. Yeah. Forget about someone downgrading the dollar. Okay. Forget about all of that nonsense. Yeah. What would happen is that's what would be what it is. Okay. And the banks would participate because the banks wouldn't be lending money anyway. Okay. Final thoughts from you, uh, Lawrence. Let's see how the stimulus package is used. I'm very supportive of the idea of using this to regenerate new technology, mm -hmm. green technology, technology for the environment. Right. Also, we need to change our value system. We have been driven so much yeah. by the value, oh, if you have so many cars, you have more cars, you have more houses, and the end of the day, whoever has the most toys when right. they die mm -hmm. wins. We have to change this because mm -hmm. our own resources on the planet are less and less. America's lifestyle cannot be supported by the rest of the planet anymore. Okay. This means change. Gentlemen, thank you for the pleasure of your company you. today. It's always nice to uh, meet new people that, uh, that, that, that provoke such interesting thought. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, Lawrence, we're, gonna, we're, we're changing gears. We're talking something very, very Earth-oriented. In fact, it's subterranean and sub Mariner. We're going to talk uh, about the na new National Geographic uh, Big Blue feature. Well, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Robert, thank you for being thank you. on the thank show you for today. Having we'll me. see you next time. Okay? Thank you. My Have pleasure. Have a good time here in Asia, and we'll catch up very soon.